Hello and welcome to this review of my Apple M0116 keyboard. I already had an M0116 with the same switches that I reviewed a long time ago, but this one I found on eBay in very good condition, so I figured I'd snag it for a redux. This one also came with the original box, which is a nice side benefit of course, always like it when I get those. Anyway, I wanted to do a redux of this because I wanted to make a specific point, which I'll start off with. See, when judging a keyboard, there are a lot of different factors to consider, and everybody weighs these individual factors differently. For example, nowadays the majority of people seem to mostly care about the form factor and layout of their keyboards, such as 60%, ortholinears, ergonomic keyboards, or all of the above. Others mainly care about the keycaps, decking them out in custom keycap sets or with intricate artisans. Others yet focus on build quality, which is where you often get those cha-ching custom keyboards that are bleeding heavy, for example, or they just want something with blinker lights on it. Now, I try to address most of these things in my reviews because I know that different viewers will want to know about these different aspects, so I try to cover everything that doesn't positively bore me to death or that I've covered in great detail before. I myself, however, when it comes down to it, mainly care about the switches, because that's what I'm typing on in the end. Having tested so many different keyboards for so long, I've become flexible enough that different layouts and form factors aren't that big of a deal to me, unless it is particularly far from a normal layout, and durability and keycaps aren't as important if I only use a keyboard for a week or so at a time. But I'm a real switch hound, I care a lot about how the keys feel, and also about how they sound. In fact, I'd say that I attach a lot more weight to how good switches sound than the majority of keyboard enthusiasts do, which is also why I like Alps so much, because those are the undisputed kings of sound in my opinion. Now, linear Alps sound great, and they have really nice travel characteristics in my opinion, but really feel-wise, or even in terms of durability, there are better options out there, such as those modern Hall Effect or optoelectric switches. And while the clickies are the best sounding of the whole family in my opinion, and feel deliciously balanced, feel-wise, buckling springs and especially beam springs are at least their equal, and are far less sensitive to things like dust incursion and heavy use. So, the linears and clickies feel nice, really nice, don't get me wrong, but I think part of my affection for them is my emphasis on switch sound. However, for tactile Alps, it is the feel above all else that really drives it home for me. Yes, they also sound amazing, and that's a great secondary advantage, but really there are so few good tactile switches out there in my opinion, and these just feel so much nicer than any other tactile switch in existence, that this is really just about the only contender for me personally. In my top 5 best tactile switches video, I had to really work to get a top 5 put together, because really the only one I can about of all was these ones. Now, I prefer oranges over salmons because I like the weighting better, but they feel really quite similar otherwise in my opinion. Salmon Alps appeared on the later iterations of this keyboard and on other contemporary Apple models. And although creams, which I covered recently, are a good contender too, with an apparently snappy tactility, they were in such poor condition that I can't say anything definitive about them, or at least not yet but that does make SKCM Orange my favourite tactile switch, well, at the moment, and frankly, nothing non-SKCM comes even remotely close to me. Even the later tactile Alps were nowhere near as good. This is also the main reason I got this one. I already had an 8 or so out of 10 M0116 with oranges, but this one was more like a 9, and I know from personal experience that a 9 out of 10 Alps board that hasn't seen too much use can be made to feel basically brand new again. So, like new orange Alps, I mean, sign me the fuck up right now. The weighting is nice and light, hard to measure it as 60 grams of force at the tactile bump, compared to 70 for salmon and 75 for black, at least that's what he measured. The tactility is almost minimalistic, but it's enough that you can definitely feel that it's there. Plus, and this is a major aspect of why the tactility in the Alps design is so nice, the force is and remains low after the bump, rather than just resuming linearly back up, and this means that it gives it much more than might be apparent just from the magnitude of the hump in the graph. It's this above all else that sets it apart from the tactile cherry switch is in my opinion, rather than just having an interrupted straight line with kind of a slanted sign shape, it's a much more disrupted, and therefore noticeable, key travel event. 
The secret to this, for my newer viewers, is the tactile element. In cherry switches, the only thing causing the tactile bump is a tiny notch carved out in the slider, which disrupts key travel a little bit as it rasps past the contact posts, but it feels more like a wobble, almost haptic. In Alps switches, there is a dedicated switch part for it, a big steel leaf spring with hooks on it that retain the slider, and then at some force it pushes past it, making the switch feel like it caves in a lot more, because a significant part of the weighting comes from the tactile element rather than the linear recoil spring, and this system, in my opinion, creates a tactile feel that is vastly superior. These switches, when in good condition like this, are very smooth, don't bind in the slightest, are light and responsive, give enough feedback that you can definitely make up the tactility, and they're just in general an absolute joy to type on. Orange Alps are in fact one of my fastest typing switches, and in the typing demo at the end of the video you'll probably see that back. Overall, I still prefer blue Alps to orange ones, but as a tactile switch, they are virtually without peers in my opinion. The board itself is typical of Apple boards of the time. It uses a rather thick plastic case with a metal mounting plate and it's built very well, although it lacks things like adjustable feet, which they probably thought would be too convenient for the end user, so they left them off. It's still got the old Apple Rainbow logo at the bottom here as well, which, even though I'm not an Apple fanboy, I gotta admit, it's still a classic. It runs off the ADB protocol, which is relatively easy to convert. There is lots of documentation on how to do it, and commercial converters are available, albeit generally overpriced. There are two ADB ports, one on either side of the keyboard. Originally, you were supposed to use the left port for plugging into the computer, because the right port was for plugging in the mouse, which was daisy-chained through the keyboard to the computer which is a nice little touch. IBM's PS2 protocol, which has a superficially similar looking connector and which would become the industry standard for many years, didn't have this capability and it used separate keyboard and mouse ports. Although later computers used a system where one port could be used for either one of the two. The M0116 was what Apple simply called the Apple Keyboard, and it was one of two models that you could buy for the Macintosh 2 and SE computers. It's a rather small model, vaguely similar to a 60% with a numpad stuck to the side, but if that seemed insufficient, you could opt for the larger Apple Extended Keyboard, or AEK instead, which was model number M0115. Both were pretty much exactly the same keyboard, except in terms of form factor and layout. The respective weights of the keyboards, for the record, are 1.1 kilos for the M0116 and 1.78 for the AEK. Or, in Imperial measurement units, good lord pip pip and telly ho old chaps. While the AEK used a standard full-size layout, something you'd pretty much exactly find on modern Apple full-size keyboards as well, the M0116 used a more space-saving alternative with some very curious design choices. First of all, it had the caps lock key where control goes nowadays and vice versa, even though the AEK and even the European versions of the M0116 had it in a more modern position. Now, I know this setup is very popular with Unix users, and to be fair, control here was pretty common at the time, but I really don't like it. I use control a lot, and when it's not where you expect it, it gets quite annoying, especially in games. It's just something I don't want to have to think about, and it adds absolutely nothing for a casual user like me. Interestingly, and again, this is typical for Apple keyboards of the era, the caps lock key uses a latching switch which stays down with every other key press. And the converter I have, which a viewer made for me a long time ago, is compatible with this, as you can hear from the lock beep sounds that the computer makes. It's quite cool, and in lieu of an indicator light, which that AEK does have, by the way, it serves as a partial substitute indicator. It also comes with a medium-ass enter key, the smaller brother to the big-ass enter key. The AEK used an ANSI enter instead, and the European model an ISO one. And especially this whole bottom row is a bit of a mess. The backslash key is here, together with tilde, and a rather useless line-shaped arrow cluster that's about as pointless as a bitch badger's balls. 
ISO models came with an L-shaped nav instead, which was almost just as bad. In fact, Apple would keep changing the layout of control and caps lock and the arrow keys back and forth constantly, as well as having or omitting the numpad, and it makes for an extremely inconsistent generation of keyboards. All the more reason just to opt for an AEK instead, which didn't have any of this bullshittery. At the time, the choice of buying an AEK rather than the ML116 was a pricey one though. It was almost twice as expensive at $229 rather than $129 in 1989. Adjusted for inflation, that's $270 and $470 respectively. Damn! I actually prefer to use the numpad for arrow key outputs with this keyboard rather than using the default arrow keys with the clear key as an improvised num lock, although Apple keyboards never actually had this functionality originally and I think they still don't to this day. There isn't a lock light for it either, which doesn't help. By the way, the big button at the top here, for those who are curious, was originally a power button, but it doesn't have a function over this particular converter. The layout is really the only thing holding this model back in my opinion. The AEK has exactly the same strengths but comes with a much better layout that's perfectly usable even to this day. I'll go on record then that in my opinion the Apple extended keyboard with orange Alps switches is without a doubt and identifiably the best Apple keyboard ever made and I consider it highly unlikely that this will ever change. From then on, of course, it all went downhill. The AEK successor, the AEK2, still used Alps switches, but they were of a later dampened design, which wasn't as crisp or smooth as the first generation oranges, and after that came the reviled Apple design keyboard and a whole slew of transparent rubber dome models, then those aluminium shits with scissor switches, and after those, the ultra-flat butterfly models that even Apple eventually admitted were unusable. This and the AEK used these PBT die sub keycaps which, unlike the ABS case and spacebar, do not yellow, as you can probably see. And all these keycaps are notable for three things. First of all, the lettering is oblique rather than upright. Second, it's in the lower left part rather than the top left, like on most keyboards. And third, the homing bumps are on D and K instead of F and J, which <laughs> disagrees with a lot of modern touch typists. Overall, the ML116 is a great little keyboard with fantastic switches. Like I said, the later ones came with salmons, which are very similar but a little bit stiffer and they sound slightly different. Great build quality and durable keycaps, it's a real joy to type on. The layout sucks donkey balls, unfortunately. I mean, Jesus, hula hooping Christ, why the fucking lie nav? But anyway, apart from that, it's all good. Really good. That's it for this review. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it and following is a typing demonstration of me typing on this keyboard.